Can I? All right, we're going to return to public session. There's nothing to report out of closed session. Um, I did before we wanted to get started. If it's an error, then I will own it on my part. But I wanted to make sure it's clear. And I'm going to call it a vote for a revote on making sure that we've um, made it clear that it's emeritus status for Jan Shard. So, can I so get a move. motion? Second. So I had a motion by Trustee Baldini and a second by Trustee Husefa. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Jan, my apologies. Right. I You're, wanted to make yeah. sure it was clear after the cake. All right. So we're moving on to the Pledge of Allegiance. Jan, would you like to lead us in the pledge? To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, And then uh, I also wanted to take a moment, and this was brought to my attention, I'm sure everybody is aware of it, but the shootings in New Zealand, and Trustee Husefa wanted to, he had requested taking a moment of silence, so I wanted to start with a moment of silence for the shooting victims, and also in general for all victims of gun violence. Did you have a few words before we take a moment? Um, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I think uh, this is very important, even though it happened um, on the other side of the world. But it is important that we recognize that um, the victims of the, I would say, terror attack, because it was a heinous, violent attack against innocent men, women, and children. Uh, I mean, I, I cannot even imagine the amount of pain or agony they might have been going through, but at least we can show our solidarity, support, and send our thoughts and prayers to them. And so that shows that the district stands against such acts and uh, that we, um, resents any kind of such actions against any person whatsoever around the world. So I would request the board to please have a moment of silence. Thank you, you guys, and thank you. Thank you. Well spoken. Safe. Uh, moving on to 7.3, this is adoption of the agenda. We did pull the request for emeritus status for Rebecca Scott to May. So with that change, okay, the agenda is adopted. Right now, public comment. Do I have any speaker cards for? I have one. So public comment and guidelines at this time, the board will devote a total of up to 15 minutes for comments to the Board of Trustees regarding any subject not appearing as an agenda item for this meeting, but over which the board has jurisdiction. The public may ask the board to place an item on related to the business of the district on a future board agenda. No action or discussion will occur at this time on such items. Individuals will be limited to a five minute presentation. And I do have public comment on, this is, well, Christina Goodman. All right. 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. My name is Christina. I have been a student here at Napa Valley College for several semesters. I'm here tonight to speak about parking citations and my experience in going through the process to contest the citation. These remarks will be a bit choppy. I had to edit it for a five minute slot. About 15 years ago when I attended university, parking tickets were about $25 at the university level and $15 at the community college level. The citation I was given in February was for $45. Despite low inflation and the Great Recession, parking citation rates tripled. Some of the law enforcement duties that used to be handled on campus have now been outsourced to a for-profit company called P-Ticket. I think there's a correlation between having a for-profit corporation getting involved and the acceleration of costs for students. Having a company that makes more money with presumed guilt is going to invite corruption. Included in the papers that I'm going to submit to the board are articles regarding private prisons. Private prison corporations have sued local governments for not providing enough prisoners and therefore there are lower profits. Does P-Ticket have an expectation that will, there will be a certain amount of citations, i.e. profits? P-Ticket itself is not exactly transparent. When you go to their website, it's unclear who runs it or where they're based. The address in which you send your first appeal is a P.O. box in San Jose. I find it interesting that it's even legal for processing of these citations to be done outside the jurisdiction of Napa Valley College. People have had difficulty reaching someone at P-Ticket. Here's a quote. No one answers the phone. I decided to do this review while still waiting for someone to answer the contact number provided on the website. And here's some highlights from a couple other people. Followed the procedure on the ticket to contest. They said they never received my contested info. And now that 21 days have passed, I'm ineligible to appeal the ticket. Nice scam, P-Ticket. I wonder how many appeals end up in the trash. If something goes wrong, there is no supervisor available to speak. There is no one that cares to be professional. Other customers say that P-Ticket hit them with late fees and fines, despite not sending communications until after getting hit with the increased fees. I sent my dispute letter certified mail, and it looks like that was a good idea, since the company may be looking to pad profits with shady business practices. Through my research, I did manage to find out that P-Ticket has revenues of $3 million. Another troubling issue with outsourcing interactions with students is the possibility of data breaches with the contracted company. Recently, Facebook came under scrutiny again for a data breach in which two third-party companies that use Facebook app data left users' information exposed. My appeal was rejected by P-Ticket, a company that has a profit motive. The next hoop to jump through is to pay and request a hearing in writing or in person. I don't know of any other crimes where you have to pay first before you get a hearing. Anyways, I got a money order and sent it along with a request for an in-person hearing. I was disappointed when I received a form from Napa Valley College, which was probably actually sent by P-Ticket based on the return address. The letter was a notice of administrative hearing. I was expecting to go to a real court. Instead, I showed up at the hearing on campus in the college police slash student health center. So the department that issued the citation is also the department that decides whether or not their officer should have ticketed you. This seems like a conflict of interest. I would not characterize what happened that day as a hearing. I would say it was more like an interrogation. My initial skepticism about a hearing on campus ended up being correct. So you meet with a much older man who's quite hostile. You're definitely put in a position of having to prove your innocence. I'm probably one of the older students here at Napa Valley College, and I could see how this could be a scary situation for an 18 or 19 year old young lady. There's definitely an unbalanced power dynamic. I'd like to know what kind of oversight there is on this hearing officer, and is this really a smart setup? Usually when a female is interrogated, most police departments try to have a female officer around. I think students should also be given the option to record the hearing. This process seemed like a waste of time. I imagine this hearing would be a burden for people who are low income and don't have jobs with vacation time. I left the hearing motivated, motivated enough to carve out time to research my comments, show up here after work. The next hoop I will have to jump through will be attending a civil court where presumably the judge is either elected by the people or has some other check on power. This whole process seems like it's burdensome, but maybe that's the point. Tire out the students so they fork over the money. 
It would be great to get data from the board about revenues P-Ticket collects from Napa Valley College students. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Christina. All right, we're gonna move to subject 9.1. This is exciting, I know the board is excited to see this. This is the State of College presentation and Dr. Kraft is going to be reviewing this report. Hi, yeah, if you can open it up and then I can either move it down. Hi, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, we have uh, a State of the College report to show for you. A couple a couple general comments on it. <clears throat> you know, the, the community really doesn't think like we think in terms of <laughs> academic years. So it's always confusing really to do 17, 18, will they really get what that means, or 18, 19. So by definition, we look backwards a little bit. So what you're really seeing is the, the 17, 18 academic year, if it will, but, but I think for the community and most folks, 18 kind of describes it. Next year at this time, we'll be talking about all the things we did this year. You know, the mariachi festival, the, the growth in faculty, you know, the, the successes that we'll have. So I will walk you through this one a little bit and comment a little bit. Um, I'm certainly not going to repeat very many metrics in this thing, but um, there's some things I would bring to your attention. Um, before I do start, I want to thank um, our Office of Institutional Advancement, um, Scott Allen and um, Carolee Catolica. And um, especially our brand new PIO, um, Holly Dawson, who came on board. Um, Hi, what do you want me to do? I'd like you to do a state of the college, and it's only due in nine weeks. And um, so it was a steep curve for her, but probably a wonderful exercise. Um, she has described that um, she's excited about the process, and we, we did do our best to, to um, kind of encapsulate the audit, who's, this, who's the suggested target audience for this? Well, it, it's not a data report, and it's not something simply for our faculty or, facu or staff or even uh, us generally. Um, it, it is a community report, and it, it is intended like, like the state of the city or the state of the county or the state of NVUSD to represent um, the highlights. Um, this report is a PDF. There's a few hard copies here that we have. It will go out to approximately 50,000 on our mailing list. Um, all students, all community members, all politicos. That's really good for us. They, they sometimes don't see or hear the things that we do, so it's exciting to, to uh, see this. The, um, Holly made me um, ensured that I would say that um, she's new to the school, so any errors and omissions are completely all Dr. Kraft's fault. Um, so there we go. Yeah. Um, let's, let's just cruise through it a little bit. Um, if we can go over to, can I do it here? Oh, okay, great, thank you. I'll just scroll quickly. Um, there is of the fabulous new board picture, which is part of our new look and feel. So you feel, felt some innovative kind of pieces here. This demonstrates two things. And, and I won't comment too much more about it, but our teaming approach at the college is paramount. Um, teams ac across breaking down silos, um, having pictures of individuals on a wall is not as good as what this represents. You are a team and, and operate as a team. So I was very, uh, I was very excited by that. Um, looking forward is just uh, Something here, celebrating our anniversary. 75th was, a, was the centerpiece of this. We are a great college, um, and we have done amazing work over the past 75 years, especially last year. It's, it, it will continue. We um, are highly regarded in the state, both for our faculty, our, our position as a, kind of an innovative leader. Um, we have a unique style. And um, the, I hear that from all over the state, from other CEOs, from PIOs, from chief instructional officers, and, and also from academic senate leaders up and down the state who I also talk with. Um, let me see if I can grab a couple more pieces here. Um, open house pictures, um, generally. Um, the open house was manned by, is that an okay word now? I, I'm just even thinking if that's uh, politically correct. Um, was 
personed by um, a, a, a volunteers. We had about 3,500 folks from the community come by, and um, uh, I think a smashing success. The um, student success metrics, um, we're here for them, and it's, and it's clear we're here for them. The, the students are front and center. Our valedictorian, <clears throat> Annabelle, was a unique person who kind of uh, started the college very early, went through the whole process, chosen for valedictorian as a lactation technician, and was a, an unusual kind of a, um, a health occupation piece that really caught everybody's eye, and she did a, a fantastic job. Academic report card, we actually get an A. Um, we did very well. We, we always have room for improvement and, and continuous improvement. But if you really start looking at these, um, we exceeded both the average and medium performance among our community colleges in four areas, and there are many more than this. But you can see that, generally speaking, we did well. Robin and um, Rippy, you know, work on these facts and figures and bring those into, into play, um, admissions and records. Um, with Jessica, works on this. I mean, basically, it's all across the system that we, that we assemble these kind of piece. Um, we continue to perform well. I have no doubt that we're going to continue to perform well as we work on new set standards and, and increase. Intentionally for the community, we're, I'm trying not to land in here with too much political educational jargon, right? All of this stuff. They don't know what CCLC or CIO or PIO or ACCJC, all those things are pretty mushy. So we, um, we intentionally stayed away. Academic quality, um, a couple pieces. The, the age bracket that you see here for the, the um, under 20 to 20 to 24 is growing. Stronger group than it used to be at 60% or so now. It's starting to feel like a younger uh, skewed campus and I can kind of feel that walking around. Um, we've had a, uh, a decline in the 40 or, or years or older. Um, it's about 15%. I think it was a bit higher, but with the restructure of, of um, repeatability and some of our other pieces the, and, and the move towards community ed, it's, uh, it's, it's hurt that a little bit. We're working on that. Female is increasing. This has been a trend over the past few years. It go, it's gone up um, each year. Um, Storm Athletics, we do a really great job for a small college with seven teams. Um, I think we have some outstanding uh, faculty and administrators in this area. Scholar athletes, as you've heard, are um, some of the best examples of California community college students. They enroll in more units than most. They maintain a higher GPA than most, and then they move on to either other colleges and universities or whatever it might be. Um, our goal is to continue that. I would love for us to be more competitive. We talked a little bit earlier about how student life, you know, potentially in, in the future and housing can make a difference. There's not a whole lot of people who show up for our games. And so if you were to go to a basketball game, it's going to be you and me and a few other people. Um, and uh, as we start to get life here a little bit, um, that will be interesting. Budget, um, again, good news. Um, and I think in some ways, g great news. If, if you're really looking across the state, um, we've got a couple pieces here. We're balanced budget. We're going to remain balanced. Our forecast for three years shows us balanced. We have a good reserve. And I think our, our dedication in terms of our commitment to labor, our commitment to benefits, and our commitment to raising the bar um, so we maintain and value our workforce is also you know, paramount. And the board, you have talked about that as well. Um, the expenses are supposed to equal revenues. When you see restricted revenues, those are pieces that come in that have to be spent on certain things, so they just balance each other out. Right? And as far as colleges go, we have people calling us for information and advice, um, and that's always a, a good place to be. Bob couldn't be here tonight. His schedule would not permit, or I, he would have spoken on this part. Um, a couple of my favorite guys here. McPherson is a wonderful, historic um, award, as you can see. 
um, co-founding, uh, the founding president, Harry McPherson. And I don't know when this started, you guys, but I think it's maybe somebody does out there. Yeah, Stephanie, maybe, I don't know. But this is, it's, it's 20 years old, I think. And, and it's an exciting piece. We, we honor our um, te two teachers every year. Sometimes it's not. Um, last year we had a, um, a part-time adjunct faculty member, and that was a, a really good, um, a good piece for him. Um, philanthropy, we'll talk about philanthropy here at the college it's enormous, and you know this in, this in the valley. We're one of the most generous valleys anywhere in California. Um, there's a lot of money here, as you, as you can see, and you read the paper and it's something, something has been raised or not. The, our philanthropy is picking up, and Ann Branch is going to present a little video at the end of this, a short one, um, who's the executive director of our foundation. Foundation, and part of my role, both job description and, and official role, is to work with the foundation and helping to raise funds for the college. Career Ed, there's three great stories here. Tiny houses in American Canyon. It's a very nice um, piece. I think that people in the community are gonna like this kind of combination. And it starts to set people up for trades, exploring the trades. And um, it also shows our collaboration in the community. The SBDC is focusing on um, our, um, yep, which is this um, Young Entrepreneurs piece. Scholar Eats is in here as well, the hospitality culinary piece, and Napa Moms machine tool training leads. So why do we include stories like this? Well, it's because this is what people live for. I mean, this is, this is a more present piece than reading metrics, is they really do understand why they're here. Our goal of being first choice for every single student in the Valley, it, it is my goal to get every single student in the Valley upon graduating from high school to consider us as their first choice. And uh, I think that we're working that way. Performing arts on stage. We have a beautiful center, as you know. Um, I think eight years ago, when I came here, it, it was not as well utilized as it is now. And our goal is to continue to work to make it open to everything from um, ceremonies for citizenship all the way to Oscars, um, I think he's going to do it monthly now. No, I'm just kidding. The, the mariachi concert, um, although it would not have held even nearly the 1,000 people who came. Um, estate wines, we're going to hear a little bit more about that. But we, we do have the largest, um, by student count, um, college wine college in, in the United States. Um, maybe the world, we're trying to figure out, there's one in Germany that has a lot of, a lot of um, students in that. It's not only a big deal, it's a leverage point, and it's attracting the larger names in the industry. If you read anything locally about harvests, maybe today, a, a, a ton, of, ton of Napa grapes is worth a lot more than any other place in the entire planet. And it is a, including um, some of the old world pieces. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Upper Valley Campus is still community education and working along. We, I think next year, we're going to be able to include in this the South Valley campus at um, American Canyon. I didn't say that right. The American Canyon campus, um, Napa Valley College, and the Mount Veter Farm. Um, both are coming along. Educational pathways, well, we live in this. And we are working seriously on seeing whether or not we can get more transfer students degreed. Um, most transfer students do not leave here with a degree. So that is a problematic piece for us because they, they, they start out their journey in life without the credential that would help them. And we have also found, and that will be probably a, a continuing piece, that the, the academic uh, credentialing of an AA degree adds value and gets you more money than a simple BA. A BA plus an AA makes you more money than a BA. And that those metrics are starting to show up in good ways. LinkedIn has a very fine article on that just recently. Um, DSPS, growing again under um, the um, student affairs area is wonderful. Community partnerships, we're just splashing a little bit. Silverado's sold, but they are going to be back. And we will host them again this summer. Um, the Bracero story was a big news. And there were many events 
honoring some of our, our, our folks here, and including Rosada and Rafael and, and families and Oscar's families, who were historically, you know, um, both, both movers and shakers, but also change makers in the valley. Um, the, 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 we kind of wanted to make sure that we didn't position ourselves as front and center, but we were here to help. And that was a, a big feel for us in the October 17. So um, we did receive this uh, certificate from, from Congress and recognizing where we were. This was a, a, a piece for me, just for you. I wasn't quite sure how heavy I wanted to hit this because this is kind of who we are. So I didn't want to take credit for more than we should be. But this is really, we have a very generous college. And that is this report. As I said, it's going out. Board members and faculty and staff, and especially leaders, this is, these are great talk points. These are the things that, um, that you want to be emphasizing in the community. We deal with challenges. We certainly have challenges. This is not the document for that, but that, that's, that's in other documents that we talk about. But um, I'm very pleased to present that. Anne's going to come up, and um, I think, just show me, is it on here? OK. And show you this uh, other piece, if I can get to it. You want to cl you close it, and I won't mess with it. Oh, you're going to turn down the lights. Oh, okay, here we go. Um, let me tell you about um, initiatives. The Napa Valley College Foundation um, was established really in 1968. It's done a tremendous job over the years, marshalling and especially concentrating on student scholarship. And it, and you'll see in this report that I just. I just handed out. Um, come over here. Um, it, you know, it, it generally is up to a quarter million dollars a year in student scholarships. Makes a huge difference. Um, their executive board last year decided that they were going to reach out. They start, they did a small um, student affairs handout uh, in terms of um, helping the the students refurbish and do and work on the the activity center over there. Um, they've been instrumental in many ways. And then Anne and team came on and started um, focusing on how could we, how can we leverage on our VWT program? And she wants to introduce this, I think, or walk them through. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So uh, bear with me while I figure out how to use the mouse and turn it on. Oh, she can turn it on. There you go. We're on. Oh, we're on. Okay. Loud enough? Not really loud. One of our alums, by the way. Napa Valley is known as the great winemaking region of America. At the heart of Napa's wine industry are the trained professionals who run it, growing the grapes, making the wine, running labs, managing barrel storage areas, making beautiful wine possible. Napa Valley College is the training ground for those professionals. Our viticulture and wine technology program is the largest in the world. Students come to Napa Valley College from all over the world to study viticulture and wine technology. The school makes world-class wines. It doesn't have world-class facilities. The goal of this effort is to put our world-class viticulture and enology instruction in state-of-the-art buildings to take the program to the next level. So one of my first weeks here teaching at Napa Valley College, I said that if you worked a 12-hour shift before you came to class this evening, you could skip clean up and go home. And me and the instructional assistant were the only ones left that were cleaning up that night. And that really speaks to our students and who they are and the sacrifices they're willing to make uh, to be here and to engage in education and try to make uh, themselves better and try to make our industry better. Um, they have families, they have personal lives, they have professions, and yet they still fit it in to come here and to take classes. And so with this new building, we're gonna be able to provide them the space and the learning environment that is really in line with the dedication that they're already showing to our program and our industry. My favorite part is when you know, a student comes out of high school in Napa and they've been around the industry their whole lives and they actually go through the program and wind up becoming a viticulturist or vineyard manager for one of our local companies. My classmates are, they're varied. They're from all different backgrounds, different ages, different 
you know, career experiences, but they all have a lot of passion for winemaking and for the Napa community. So the Viticulture and Enology Department was our home for approximately three years because we took every course we could take to help us achieve our dream of being the best grape growers we could be. Uh, the department offered wonderful classes that gave us a good start in the knowledge that we needed uh, to work right alongside a new vineyard we had planted. As a testimony to our dedication, this year Steve received the 2018 Grower of the Year Award that was given by members of the Napa Valley Grape Growers Association. In some, I think continuing education is so important because we need to provide on an ongoing basis for the sustainability of our industry in Napa Valley. And uh, the Wine Education Center is going to be a critical part of that. The program here at the college allows us to train people to obtain jobs that will keep them in the community. We're always looking for well-trained uh, employees in the wineries and in the vineyards. And the Napa Valley College program suits it perfectly. So we get to people that come out of the college and know exactly what it is we're looking for because we have the instructors that teach them what we need. I was able to land a position with uh, Robert Mondavi just to complement the experience. It was my first wine position. There's no way I could have got that position if I had not come here. Just from the contacts, the knowledge, great professors, great students, great environment. So we actually built our Zahavinier's business plan in my marketing class here at Napa Valley College. When I think about the new Wine Education Center, uh, what that really brings us is the opportunity to take this whole education to the next level. We have been training students to be familiar with concepts, but the idea of giving them enough lab space, enough classroom space where they can literally do it 10, 20, 30 times rather than doing it once and watching another student do it five or six times. It will really bring this program, to my mind, to a world-class level. Over the past 20 years, our vineyards, our wineries, and our restaurants have grown to the point where we need additional staff, we need additional help in all of our businesses. So today we're going forward with the Wine Education Center and we as all of the industries of Napa Valley need to come together and raise the funds necessary to help them help us. Yay. Okay, thanks. Okay, so. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we love the video, and all the people who helped produce it are in the video are very excited about this project. We are, um, we have a, just over three million pledged toward the um, end goal. We have three phases in mind, and we think it's going to be great. So, and I'd like to thank Dr. Kraft for his um, kind words um, in the report. The foundation is moving along. We are, um, we have some new board members, some new enthusiasm, and some great projects going forward. So if you, and if you, I know Michael sent me some leads, so if any of you have any leads you'd like me to speak with, I'd be happy to. <laughs> it's a pitch. That's good. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you. You guys have any questions or anything for? So it'll be an ongoing piece. The board, as you as you recall, last year authorized the, this campaign, and um, um, I think that we'll probably we're waiting for another gift um, that's imminent, and we'll we're yet in a soft opening piece. This has not gone live yet, so I'm sure that we're going to be at uh, more than halfway there before it even goes live. So it's very good. Um, thank you. It's my pleasure to do that. I'm hoping you spread the word with this um, community report. Is there a time frame for when the video and all that's going to go live? Or um, yes.
right? There, yeah. There, I think the, the only other thing on, on this, thank you, Ann, very much. Yeah, there's a, there will be an event, um, several events, um, one of which uh, down the line would be wonderful, lovely for the board to be there. And, and um, at some point in time, we'll be cutting a ribbon, I hope, um, out there on the new center. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, moving to item 10, reports. We're going to start with Academic Senate Report, Amanda Badgett. Yikes. Uh, good evening, board. So, finally, we didn't think it was going to happen, but spring break actually begins tomorrow. And I know um, most of us uh, have seen our poor students in the last two weeks, three weeks, kind of fade before our eyes. So, uh, in any case, uh, spring break came a little late this year, but we are here we almost are. Um, I'd like to uh, just mention uh, it was nice to chat with Jeff Dodd and Beth Goff uh, at our recent Senate leadership meeting, monthly meeting we had with Dr. Kraft. We had the opportunity to um, have a conversation about uh, with our newest board members about matters 10 plus one and answer questions and I, and I hope clarify any, any matters. Um, <clears throat> Meanwhile, the Senate is busy. We uh, just did approve a change to our bylaws, which reflects a new-ish committee structure, somewhat based on the pilot uh, that we launched two years ago. So, uh, and uh, we are also currently uh, seeking nominations for the executive board of the Academic Senate, the president, vice president, Sec first and second, treasurer and secretary, and we have a number of names. And those, no the nominations close tomorrow, and then voting begins after spring break. So, um, yes, yeah, so lots of changes uh, in the air. And I'm uh, reminded of uh, the fact just this morning I was teaching uh, Japanese art and uh, my survey of Asian art. and students, we were all talking about uh, the idea of impermanence. It's something, it's a theme that uh, recurs in Japanese art, whether it's cherry blossoms on a screen or the fact that a Shinto shrine is actually torn down every 20 years and rebuilt. The idea of impermanence is something kind of built into Japanese art and culture. And it's very much on my mind tonight uh, as we head into what is essentially the last month of this semester, and I dare say probably more changes uh, underway. But before I close, I want to congratulate my colleague Jan Shart on her retirement, and I'm looking forward to the classified appreciation event tomorrow. So with that, I will close my comments. Thanks. Know that we're so committed to the Senate. We Itemed this number. This item is 10.1 academic senate. You know, so it's 10 plus one. I thought it was uh, very clever. Huh? <coughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so Bob Harris is not here. He's an attending attending an event for his division. So there's no uh, administrative confidential senate report. And I do not see Raphael. I have his. Monzo. I have his report. So 10.3 associated students. You're on. Thank you. Um, so this is from Rafael Manzo. Greetings board, this is the report to ASNVC, off ASNVC, pardon me, by Rafael Manzo. Sorry to dash away, but I have to class to attend. I've authorized Josefa as my designee. The board is currently assessing our needs while also continuing to develop ideas for events or initiatives that we can still accomplish. We have a weekly work group session in conjunction with oversight by Dr. Kraft. I do wish to point out that at the last Board of Trustees meeting, our student trustee requested a new agenda item, which is, colon, that the trustees consider approving our meeting minutes. It is understood from the Brown Act training that agenda requests don't always make it onto the very next meeting agenda. It's okay that it's not on today's agenda, however, the upcoming trustees meeting for the month of May will be our last. And so there's enough time to get through with this agenda item. 
getting these documents approved is very important because of the transparent transparency with uh, with our campus and public. We just don't have a quorum, as you know, uh, to approve them ourselves. If we are permitted to approve them at, at our work group sessions, that would work too. But if not, then we'd like the approval to be on the next trustee's agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Josefa. I know Dr. Kraft is working with you guys on that, and we'll see what we can come up with in regards to that. Um, next, we have 10.4, Classified Association Report. Jan Shard. Good evening. Well, this is my last board meeting. <laughs> and um, I want to introduce Valerie Mall behind me. Valerie's our new incoming president. She takes over on May 1st. And um, we had to do early elections because I decided to leave early. Um, so I know the new board's going to enjoy working with all of you and continue on the work that um, we have all started. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 10.5 <laughs> classified Senate report. Martin Shoemaker, I do not see him. So that jumps us to 10.6, Faculty Association Report, Christy Iwamoto. Good evening, board. Uh, we had a faculty association meeting today, and uh, I was given uh, permission from the faculty association general uh, uh, meeting today to, uh, to give this report, which is actually something that is very near and dear to my heart and something that I think is very important. Uh, so I wanted to uh, just bring attention for a second to Husefa over here. Husefa is our student trustee, and he is a student in my English 121 class. Excellent student. <laughs> uh, if Husefa has any questions about a journal assignment or wants to go over a draft of his essay with me before he turns it in or wants to discuss a particular reading assignment in more depth, I actually have five hours a week available to him in the form of office hours. Uh, if he had chosen another English 121 class, one taught by a part-time faculty member, he would have absolutely none. He'd have no time available to meet with this instructor without, about any of his issues. Why? Because the district doesn't think that part-time faculty office hours are worth paying for. This is a student equity issue, and it's absurd that for the very same class, some students get five hours a week of instructor access, and some get zero just based on the hiring status of that instructor. Here at Napa Valley College, we have a handful of office hours for our part-time faculty. These are only for English and math instructors on developmental and freshman levels. But what about upper division classes? What about complex classes like psychology or like history, literature, or advanced trigonometry? With AB 705 looming, these students have less skill building support than ever. And now they don't even have access to some instructors outside of their own classrooms. Some of my part-time colleagues will say to me, I know I don't get paid for office hours, but I meet with students anyway. And I have to tell them, don't. Do not. The district has to care about student success just as much as you do, and right now they're showing that they do not. Unwaged labor shouldn't be the answer to this problem. Solano College has had part-time office hours across the board for over a decade. So is Santa Rosa Junior College. Why are we behind the times? What did they get that we do not? When asked why this is not a priority, the district says that offering part-time office hours does not attract applicants. Well, why should it when so many other districts already have them? But you know, it's not about that. It is about the students. It's all about the students. Isn't that what we always say? The union believes in equal pay for equal work. Students are paying equal tuition and they should receive equal access. That is my report. Thank you, Christy. 10.7, Superintendent, President's report. Um, just one thing, I was just, if I can get it back up here, sorry. Oh, it wants me to look at it, there we go. Um, the, let me think about this for a moment. Um, I, w I don't have an, a, a, a printed report, but I, I would, um, call out that um, Holly had sent me this. I invite you to join me at the Napa County Board of Supervisors meeting on Tuesday, April 16th at 9 a.m. 
to accept a proclamation naming April, April Napa Valley College District Month. Um, the proclamation is being presented in conjunction with the state legislature, naming April 2019 as California Community College Month. Um, again, a nice um, n nod uh, in the community. So that is April 16th, 9 a.m. If um, and the Board of Supervisors, and I will give you more information if you'd like more about that. Um, just of note, we're starting in the, the process of the McPherson Distinguished Teaching Awards. It's always an exciting time, and I'm, uh, I'm not sure who's on, the, who's on the committee this year, Beth. Oh, that'll be great. You'll enjoy that. Um, the Puente program celebrated its 15th special on April 2nd. Oh, if you have it, up. Oh, it's all right. It's all right. We can, okay. And um, it, it's always a wonderful, heartful event. And it, it's such a great program where students find a home, a mentor, a, you know, a success path. And it was really a very heartening thing to, um, to go to and to watch. And Founders Day, this is just a reminder. We're continuing this, this Founders Day um, year after year. Some, yeah, last year was a big one, and this year we'll host um, the day. Um, and this is on, can you scroll down just a little bit? Thank you. I'm reading it now. Um, um, one to six. I was curious about the time. So I think Mike Thompson will be here and other dignitaries will be here. And, and, and again, this is our gift, if you will, in, in, in reaching out to the community, sharing our, our value. PTK, I was very happy to go with PTK, um, Phi Theta Kappa, our honorary society. It's generally linked and almost always to the president's office. Um, we were in Sacramento. Um, two students went with us, and I'm trying to find Esperanza Padilla, who was named the Coca-Cola Academic Team Silver Scholar, receive a, a $1,200 scholarship. And um, in the room, I mean, you've got Little Napa College, right, with two students who represent a, uh, a significant um, impact, being first or second team. And you, in that room, you're talking about probably 100 people who represent the top one-tenth of one percent of all scholars in the community college world in the United States. So it's, it's really heartening. We do good work here. And um, to, to Christy's point and the faculty's point, um, um, it shows. And um, I'm excited about um, you know, showing that off as well. So um, that's my report. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, so approval minutes. These are minutes of last month, 314.19. Proposed, Catherine will open them if requested. Do I have any? Look at that, all right. Just a small change, sorry. Uh, do you have, it? oh, uh, it, in, in my report, the name says uh, uh, um, Ron Townsend. It's Ron Downs. Thank you. Thank you. With the change noted by Husefa minutes. Sure. Have a second? Second. second. Have a motion for approval by Trustee Dodd, second by Trustee Husefa. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, motion carries unanimous. Uh, now we're on 12, item 12, consent calendar. Approval of consent calendar. Do I have anyone? I have a second. I have a motion to approve by Trustee Baker, a second by Trustee Goff. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries unanimous. Consent calendar is approved. Jumping to. Academic affairs information discussion. 13.1 curriculum changes, spring 2019. This is Eric Shear. It would be just a motion. I move. Second. Have a motion to approve by Trustee Baldini with the second from Trustee Baker. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries unanimous. 13.2. First reading, College and Career Access Pathways. This is the CCAP Partnership Agreement with Napa Valley Unified School District. This is a information item. Do I have who's presenting this one? 
Well, it, we won't present unless you have you know questions on it. But I think Eric has a, at least a few comments on it. Right? Do you need? I mean, uh, here's here's <laughs> Hi, the question. The question is the board. If the board's read this, I'm sure. I mean, are there questions that we need to clarify? That that would be. Yeah. Two. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Two. Can I ask them? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So on. Um, 2.2L, it says, within the context of the CCAP partnership with the school district, the college district, district may enroll a special part-time student in up to a maximum of 15 units per term, so long as the unit constitute no more than four classes per term. I, I don't understand how that fits in. I, I don't know a situation where that would happen or be needed, and I just wanted it to be clarified. Yeah, so I, I'm op I got kicked out of board docs too, so I'm I'm reloading my. No, you're oh. fine. You're fine. <laughs> and, and can you give me the citation again on that? Yeah, two point two L. Two point two L. And this is the first one. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and, and both, and they're identical. So yes, they're with identical. with the with yeah. the exception so of the one. appendices, um, uh, yes. these would be identical on this. So uh, th this is all required language as part of the CCAP agreement. Right. So right. so the the the, temp the the template that we uh, use here in the in the community college system comes from the chancellor's office. And so this provision is something that's written into it specifically. Okay. Um, so, so maybe, maybe um, we haven't. Yeah. So I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to think of a scenario and, and I, and I'm not going to put somebody else on the spot who's out here who deals with dual enrollment Even students. Though. Um, but, uh, if anybody has any thoughts on this, I'd certainly be willing to, uh, entertain them at this point, Jessica. <laughs> sure. Sure. I was just wondering um, if I could have an example of why this would be needed to have a um, college district may enroll a special part-time student. I'm not sure what that is in up to a maximum of 15 units per term. So, so <clears throat> our special part-time students yes. uh, have to fill a special petition out because they're, they're students that are eligible to attend, but only with permission, permission from the principal of the school, permission from the, oh, par okay. the parent, and then per permission from the student. So it's considered a special enrollment, okay. even though they're eligible students, so they are 15 years of age or, right. or older. And the 15 units is a, is a, 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 a greater number of units than in the past. In the past, high school students were limited to 11 units under under full time, okay. and so and that was a limitation basically, so that they weren't a full time high school student and a full time right. college student. student. With gotcha. CCAP students, there can be a need for a student to take more units, and so the the legislation is per more permissive, or the, the the rules that have been laid forth have said, okay, with CCAP we want to allow for um, high school students to enroll in more units if appropriate. Gotcha. gotcha. Thank you. Stay there. Thank you, Stay Jessica. there. I have one more question, okay. just in case. <laughs> I want to take care of him. You rock. Um, so in 2.5, it talks about student registration and enrollment. Mm -hmm. And since you're experienced on the high school and, and college side, mm -hmm. um, you have an idea that on the high school side, we start registration in January for the fall. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know when your timeline is as far as when you develop your courses for the fall or when you, when you do that. And I'm just wondering... Does that align? Are are you ready to to make that work? How does you know? I I've just had a question. How that so works. our schedule building process um, does not coincide with the timeline for the high schools. Right. So our our registration for fall opens up at. Um, on the all opens up well in May in so, May yeah. yeah so so ours, ours right. happens later our right. schedule building process starts uh, for the fall semester it would start at the beginning of the spring semester okay. one of the things though that we're that we're looking at right now is we're going forward with with this and we're um, anticipating more of these dual enrollment type agreements mm -hmm. is to actually um, start looking at it a year at a time on our scheduling okay. Um, okay. this is one of the practice good practices that we yes. should really start employing here right. at the college so so there's there's discussion regarding okay. that Okay. Um, but yeah, at, at this point in time, no, the, the, the timing's a little bit off on those things. Okay, okay, great. That was all I had. Thank I have a, just a comment on that yes. that point, that very point. Uh, I'm glad to hear that um, you just said that you're starting to look at a year kind of ahead because I know this foreclosed some options up Valley yeah. where they had to put their schedule out and decide whether to do dual enrollment or yep. continue with their current schedule, and they had to continue with their current schedule. Yeah classes so that's yep. good to hear yep great questions trustee golf and to uh rafael rios 13.3 this is the ccap partnership agreement with the saint Helena unified school district again information any questions discussions 
Okay. Go. And just one other thing I want to add in here for the board on this too. So um, this is the second time around that we've, that we've worked with St. Helena Unified School District on this. So they were our first one that we did it with, and it's been a great success this year. We've had a, we've had a math class and a cohort of students going through math classes this year at St. Helena High School. Um, the 13.2 item, the one with Napa Valley Unified School District, is the same concept, the same language. What's different about Napa Valley Unified, though, is that there are multiple comprehensive high schools and other high schools within the district. So unlike St. Helena, where the agreement with the district was the agreement with the individual high school, as stipulated in Appendix B on these documents, um, with Napa Valley Unified, now that we have this, and this is a first reading on it, once we have the basic framework in the district-to-district -district agreement, that Appendix B, when you're reading, reading through these, is the part that we're going to use to tailor the specific, to the specific needs of the individual high schools. And so once the major framework is approved between the two districts, that Appendix B can be updated on a regular basis to include um, new potential dual enrollment as, as we go forward on it. So as new opportunities become available and we're, and we're able to work that out, um, it, the, the framework allows us some flexibility within that uh, because that's how we would address the individual high schools. So just as a, as a, as a point, because um, I think that there was a question, a little bit of a question around that uh, prior to the board meeting tonight. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. And again, it's great to see, as Jessica pointed out, uh, have legislation that's in line with some of these students that are probably pretty eager and doing well in school. Uh, all right, so we're moving on to administrative service. There's nothing here. Human resources, nothing. 16, student affairs, nothing. So 17, general um, information. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. There, there, there's a piece of, of, of information that I'd like to share that I didn't, that I didn't have time to, uh, to add to log or to put By in. By all means. It's, it's, it's just brief information. It's, it's, it's information, it's, uh, it's data, excuse me. It's data on, on the upcoming uh, high school breakfast uh, oh. for, for April 25th. And just share with you that, that we have uh, uh, 80 participants who have, who have registered to, to be here for the various school districts, which includes 20 high schools, uh, uh, six agencies that are other than, than, than high schools. Uh, two adult schools, one middle school, and uh, six school districts. Um, so this is, a, again, it's, it's a 14th annual. And if you have not yet made your reservations or your RSVPs, and if you would like to attend, please make sure that you contact my, my office so we can add you to the list. We also have approximately another 72 college staff members who will be attending as well. So once again, it's going to be a, a nice lar large event. So please, if you haven't made your reservations and would like to attend, uh, please let us know. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. All right, uh, so 17.1, this is district reorganization. Here, yeah, let me set this up um, just a little bit. It, the, unusual. Um, generally speaking, I was just jotting some notes to myself. You know, we do adjustments will happen at the staff level. So it, in other words, cabinet or individual vice presidents or um, de all the way down, do adjustments in their own departments. Um, workflow sometimes, sometimes, sometimes people doing different work and, and they work on that. Then we have realignments sometimes, which are a little, a little more um, involved. Um, we have restructure where we move things, things around. None of these would ordinarily come to the board. They're not in the board's purview. Um, reorganizations generally speaking, would not come to the board except for major reorganizations, and that's what I'm bringing you tonight. So, and basically you'll see that this is to endorse. So uh, I would urge the board as you're looking at these, this is for, it is an action item, and I put on here intentionally for that, so you can endorse um, you know, the work that staff has done. What you're looking at tonight in terms of um, the organizational charts, um, I used to believe that everybody went to B school, uh, business school, and had deep understanding of organizational charts, you know, line and staff, a dotted line meant something different, but the case is not. So you may have questions about where things lie, um, and, and that's fine. Stay at a policy level, if you will, and um, it's mostly for your understanding, and, and you would want to be focusing, I hope, on the kind of um, cohesion with mission you know, um, and those pieces. Um, Oscar is um, going to present, Eric is going to present, and I will as well. I'm not sure about order, gentlemen, you know, what we've, what we've chosen. 
Yeah, they're both. Yeah, please, you go, you go. Um, yeah. Okay, so we can go ahead and start off uh, by pulling up the academic affairs area. So um, I want to start off by saying this is the shortest and smallest version of this org chart that has ever existed. Um, it's gotten to the point now in our area that the long form on this, if you will, is about ready to become an 18 by 24 inch poster, uh, not, not an organizational chart. I think we're already up to having to... Uh, uh, printed out on 11 by 17 inch paper at this point. Um, so what we're providing here for you is the really high level look to address the uh, to address the larger issue that um, Dr. Kraft was was bringing up with this. So I, I want to give a little bit of context for this. So. Um, at the top of this, the darker gray box is me as the Assistant Superintendent Vice President for Academic Affairs. The yellow boxes down below represent the, the five deans that report to, directly to me. Um, the, the notable thing about this isn't that there are five deans, it's that a year ago there were seven. And so this represents a major reorganization in our area with a broadening of the scope of the responsibilities of each of the deans um, that we have in the academic affairs area. This is, hap this is happening at a point when we've also um, opened up a new classification for deans in the ac in actually at the institution. And the title is uh, effective this summer is senior dean for these positions. And so I'll explain a little bit about what this is. This is the result of the last three years of analysis and organizational work that, that I've been conducting in my area and working on with my, with my colleagues in the executive team. Um, the, the, uh, the, the structure that you see here in front of you doesn't have one dean that existed um, uh, up to about a year ago, and that was a, a position called the Dean of Instruction. So the Dean of Instruction was a position that historically sat in the office with the Vice President of Instruction, as it was then called. That dean was largely responsible to be the, uh, the person that took the direct reports for most of the academic divisions at a time when we didn't have administrators that were dedicated to specific divisions. Um, and and so um, as, as over the last three years, we have uh, fleshed out our full complement of administrators and every division, every academic division and department on campus has a specific administrator who has assigned responsibility for that area. The need to have the separated out position of the Dean of Instruction um, uh, became less important, quite frankly, because those deans could be delegated a lot of those responsibilities directly from me as the vice president. So this is a, so this is a, a, an organization that's actually taken a layer out of it um, in terms of the upper level bureaucracy um, in between the vice president and the deans that are responsible for the day-to-day -day operations, the academic programs, services, and divisions at Napa Valley College. And so um, with, the, with the four deans, um, with the four deans beginning from the right and going over, we have our senior dean for health and safety, that's Bob Harris. Uh, Bob Harris is responsible for the, all of the health occupations programs. He is responsible for um, the divisions of uh, physical education, athletics and kinesiology, and uh, responsible uh, it, as, as a dean also for the direct report of the assistant dean for physical education, and also a number of directors that serve in the various programs, also over the criminal justice training program or the police academy. Um, uh, going on to the left on that is the Senior Dean for Language Arts, Library, and Social Sciences, currently occupied by Maria Villa Gomez. Um, Maria is responsible for the operations of the library in two academic divisions, the Division of Social Sciences and the Division of Language Arts and Developmental Studies, um, and then also a number of services that are associated with it. She also has many direct reports underneath her that are not indicated here on this chart as well as one can imagine with that scope of operations. Um, to the left of that is the Senior Dean for Career Education and Academic Pathways. This is Diana Shibodi. Um, she's presented here at the board many times. Um, I think most of you know, know her. She's usually sitting in the back of the room every night here. She happens to be at a conference at the moment. But she is our dean that's responsible for all of the workforce development programs, the career education programs. And in this new configuration, she's also going to be taking on a point for uh, many of our uh, educational initiatives uh, here at the college, so things like guided pathways pathways, um, things like our dual enrollment um, uh, work that we're doing, uh, things, things that in the past might have lived with the Dean of Instruction. As I said, we're disseminating those out to the, to the v deans that are going to be carrying this new title of Senior Dean. And then uh, to the left of that is the Senior Dean for Arts and Sciences, uh, currently occupied by Rob, uh, Bob Vanderveld, Robert Vanderveld. Um, 
So one of, one of my, one of my uh, proudest moments in all of this is that I've shortened people's titles. Um, I don't, uh, you know, uh, these name badges are only so big and the business cards are only so big. Um, and we're getting up to 60 characters plus in some of these titles. So arts and sciences has a really nice ring to it. But he's responsible for the Department of Math, for the Division of Science and Engineering, and also for the Arts and Humanities Division and all of the operations that go on in all of those areas, including responsibility for all of the facilities associated with that. Um, again, he's not doing all of that directly himself. He has other folks that are working with him um, uh, to manage all of those processes. And then on the left is the Dean of Centers in Community Education, which is currently occupied by uh, Michelle Mano. So this is a combination of the work that she was doing previously as the Dean of the Upper Valley Campus, but broadening it out. And one of the major things that I want to point out in the broadening of, of her scope of responsibilities on this is that effect of this coming fall, she's going to be taking on the responsibilities of the nighttime administration here at the college. It's not going to be five nights a week. It's not going to be every, every week in that way. But one of the things that we cut many years ago during our budget, budget crisis was an extra stipend that we used to give to a dean uh, to come in and serve as the nighttime administrator. That became the dean of instruction for a while as well who was doing that work. But since then, we have not had an academic administrator on staff for our evening students and for all of our faculty, a lot of whom are part-time that teach in the, in the evening hours. And so we will be staffing her at critical times during the semester, particularly around the beginning of the term and then throughout the term uh, to fulfill this important role. So um, again, this is the high level look at it. Um, do we, I, I want to scare you just by showing you what the real org chart looks like. Um, so just, just to indicate that, that we, we make it look simple and certainly the people that are fulfilling these roles make it look very simple on most days because of their incredible expertise and uh, skill in what they do. But um, we're, we're a large organization and we've got a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of helping hands that are involved in making this work happen and serving our students. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Do we have any questions? Thank you, Eric. It was very thorough. I've scared you. <laughs> yeah, you did. I'm taking over the world one org chart at a time. Oscar? Well, first, I, well, first I want to apologize for, for not having nice uh, shades and colors, but, but, but I'm colorblind. So, um, but, but I wanted to... Uh, thank Eric for, for his work. His, his chart is beautiful. It really is. Uh, in, 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 uh, in the situation of student affairs, we've actually we, we've added one dean. Um, and the reason for this is that currently I have 14 managers who, who, who report to me directly uh, called direct reports. And I meet with these individuals uh, every other week to make certain that whatever needs to be done or, or whatever issues need to be addressed are addressed in a timely manner. However, though, I have found out that, that uh, it's great to have all these all, all the reports to, to me, but there's sometimes uh, the time that I need that I don't have to address institutional matters, to be more involved with, with initiatives um, here within the institution. Uh, and so what I've done is I've added a dean. In this case, and we'll start first of all at, at the far left with, with the first dean, the senior dean. Uh, with the student affairs, we will have three senior deans. Uh, the, the first one's noted is uh, is Howard Lewis, Howard Lewis, Howard, Howard Willis. Uh, he's our dean of counseling and student uh, su success, um, along with the transfer center counseling and such. Um, he will be one of our senior deans. Uh, the next senior dean is uh, Patty Morgan. Uh, she, as you know, is in charge of financial aid, veterans, uh, EOPS, and, and and the like. And the new senior dean is uh, called the uh, dean of student affairs. Um, and so. Uh, my, my thought here is that I'm going to consolidate as much as I can within the functions that I, that I, that I currently have within those 14 uh, managers and shift some of the responsibilities onto this new dean. Um, so, and I haven't given you the, uh, the details yet because first of all, the, the person has not been hired. This position was approved in a 17, uh, 18 year and I'm about to hire it here pretty soon. But I've been waiting a bit to make certain that whatever I do realign makes sense. And, uh, and this individual, uh, he or she will have uh, a series of uh, responsibilities 
and um, and I've already discussed who is going to be going there, who who will be leaving my supervision as vice president and going under this new dean. But I haven't discussed it with all the parties, so so I won't disclose much information because I I owe it to to them first to to let them know um, where where they will be uh, going. Um, uh, the next dean is is the dean of DSPS. This position was an associate dean. However, part of the the, uh, the restructuring is that this individual will be responsible for being the key person for OCR complaints. As you know, in, in times past, we've had some some complaints uh, from students who believe that services that they were that they were eligible for uh, that they're entitled to uh, were not received. And so sometimes what they do is that they question it and they file a um, a grievance. So. In order to make certain that those do not arise as often as they have, in order to make certain that someone's going to be there to to nip things at the bus, so to speak, uh, uh, I've I've elevated uh, the associate dean to to a dean. In addition, this individual will also be uh, responsible for one of the other areas that we're supervising, which is the testing center. Uh, ne next to that is is our is our is our associate dean, who is now a dean also, uh, and that's Jessica Erickson. And Dean of Enrollment and Enemy Services. Um, and this role, they will also be receiving some additional uh, functions and duties. Uh, namely, uh, we are going to include student government and uh, student life under this position, uh, under the auspices or under the direction of uh, jo uh, Jolie St. Saint Clair and the Welcome Center. However, it will, it will be Jessica who will be responsible, will be responsible for, for monitoring the activities and such of uh, student life uh, and um, and student government. So, uh, and good luck, Jessica. Uh, the the other uh, the other dean that we have is associate dean of Mesa and STEM. Uh, this position has been an, an associate dean and will remain in in its current title and function as well. And the other position that that will that will be supervised by me directly is the council coordinator for the Emoja program. Uh, this program was once in, in instruction, and about three years ago, we agreed that it'd be appropriate to uh, place under student affairs, and uh, and it's been there since, and, and we've done a good job, thanks to the help also of, of, of my colleague here, Eric. We're above that, though. You have Mar Martha Navarro, and I think everyone knows who she is. She is the vice president of student affairs, um, in terms of what what she does, and, and being very and very much on top of things. But also then, uh, uh, with with the dotted lines. To, to, to my left, to my title, we had the Title IX co-coordinator. Uh, Shara and I share the responsibility for any Title IX sexual harassment, um, sexual violence issues that may take place on campus or off campus for that matter. Uh, I handle those situations that are student on student, and Shara handles those situations that are student on, on staff and, and or faculty. And that, uh, and that one right below that, the South Valley campus, which is not South Valley campus, it's American Canyon, uh, campus. That's their own, uh, just as a, like a temporary. Uh, what, what Dr. Kraft had asked me to do about a year and a half ago or so was to sort of get things going with, um, with movement on signage. And so we've been working with a school district uh, and, and with a high school, and uh, we, we, we will be having our own signage, our own mar marketing, our own label, if you will, uh, on several of the buildings there. And uh, that is promised, is it's a promise to me anyway, by size dimension that that work will take place on the week of June the 10th. So if all goes well, uh, by, by midsummer, as you drive by the Marion Canyon campus, you will see the signage of Navajo College on doors and on, uh, and, and on buildings. Uh, we also have there, we have an, an, an office space that's used by the specialists and by the outreach folks. Uh, the, the, this campus has the uh, great fortune of being uh, probably the only one of the service area high schools that has someone there from our outreach staff at least twice or three times per week. So you're very fortunate with that. You must feed them well. I don't know what you what you do, but but they're very happy to be there. Busy. They're very it's busy. busy. But uh, but actually, it's 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 the uh, it's invitation that we have from 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 your from your counselors and from your principal, and it's worked out very very well. So in short, this is uh, this is what I'm what I what I, what I propose to do. What I'm asking you to you to support. Um, I believe it's it's the uh, it's it's the best uh, uh, structure for for my area. One thing that I that left off about the the uh, the senior dean of student affairs. I've been in this business for close to 30 years now, and I've been directly responsible for student conduct for about 20 of those years. 
and uh, it gets old some, sometimes. So uh, this new dean will have the, uh, the honor of being responsible for student conduct and student discipline. Um, so uh, thank God for that. So anyway, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so this is my structure. This is what I believe uh, will work for student affairs for here until the next maybe 10 years or so. So thank you once again. Thank you, Oscar. Are you Dr. Kraft, are you going to go through yours? Uh, I am. Uh, um, it's shorter. And I have one um, serious omission on this as we, as we looked at it. And I'll, I'll start from the top, but I, I think I'll address the omission first. Um, on the right-hand side, if you go to the, uh, the dean of research, that should say senior dean. I'm not sure why it didn't make it, Robin. I will apologize to Dr. Warnall um, especially. So uh, that, that will be inserted there. So um, a couple of different things. Yeah, you have seen the, certainly the uptake and the responsibility in terms of compliance issues, reports, all of that piece uh, across the institution. It's, it's um, I would say, even I've, in the last eight, it may have doubled in the kinds of stuff that, that um, is going on. And she has to wait through this, so you can, you can do a couple more tonight. Um, but um, the, the senior dean of research is very responsible for so much of what goes on, and including, and in this title is also the ALO, which is the Accreditation Liaison Officer, which keeps us um, on track on time and uh, able to, you know, to do what we do. So that's an omission that we had. Um, the, the, the next one to the left here is a, is a change, um, a significant change. Um, this is Associate Vice President of HR, Training and Development. It moves from an executive director's role, um, which was a, um, an important change several years ago when we anticipated this. This is an area, that, again, that has grown in massive complexity. Um, uh, the, the reason that we are um, moving towards the, the AVP role here is there is, in the current structure of our college, there really is um, nothing, there, is, n there hasn't been an AVP, it's just a VP or an associate superintendent. So this, this creates um, two, two or three things. One, it, um, both in Charles Auberon's case, it, it creates an advancement. It also creates a pathway for the future for the college as it grows and matures. Um, for uh, other potentials. And, and you simply have to look across the state at uh, other organizations and you can see how they've um, employed this position. Um, the big um, move here is training and development. Um, training is going to take a couple years, but the, the goal here is to coordinate and concentrate on providing all level of um, training um, through one, a one stop, if you will. Um, it's not to be confused. We're still working on the faculty piece, and the, you know, fa faculty development is is different. But I think the help that we might be able to do is help coordinate or communicate that. Um, but certainly, all the other trainings, which we, as we counted, are, are approaching 60, um, they're all across the institution, and um, this will this will help us um, consolidate that. Public information officer is a new role here. It's a direct report to me. Um, you'll see that um, right now it does not have any support, but um, that person relies on um, the, the president's um, office um, executive assistant and um, the executive coordinator, Catherine, and also they, their current office is in the Office of Institutional Advancement, so they get a little bit of help there as well. Director of, um, Inst of Office of Institutional Advancement. The only differences here are down below. Repographics and printing is moving over to that area. It was a con it's traditionally been there, and most years at the college, it, it was under this area. When we downsized during the bad times, you know, 12, 13, 14 of dollars, we combined that position with a warehouseman. So it made sense because it was over in kind of Matt Christensen's area, but we're moving that back. Um, the point, the single point of contact that um, Rick Foley, the, the, the um, uh, I don't know, where Rick's title, the printer, um, is really in OIA and he works with Scott um, Allen over there. Webmaster is on here for the future. A uh, very important piece. There, th this is not the technical behind the scenes, but the person who would help coordinate the content 
templates of, of the college, work with Jessica, work with both, both sides of the college to ensure that um, we are really a, uh, you know, a, a, a college that's student-ready, that's friendly, that's accessible, and all of that is um, quite important. Um, my office is on the far side, executive coordinator, and um, which is Catherine, she's doing um, a good job. No changes there, an executive assistant is um, all the secretaries are moving to this, you know, either administrative assistant or, and some are moving to executive assistant, so we're abandoning the term secretaries at, yeah, all across the board, right, Charles? Yeah? Yeah. And then um, off to the right, what appears here, obviously you, you all are there, is my, uh, my boss, is the Napa, Cali Napa Valley College Foundation. This traditionally hasn't been there for a couple years because the foundation has gone there, there uh, own way. They're, they're now coming back into the fold, if you will. Um, again, as I alluded to, my job description includes this report um, and job responsibility. It, um, I work with the executive director in strategic planning, help her in design and, and um, all the way through the process. And um, this represents generally the president's area. Um, and I guess that that's it, really. So you know, there, I'm up for questions on any of this, of course. And I'm really looking for a, just a general notion. You can just take them as a group um, for endorsement moving forward. It would be wonderful. It is, it's listed as an action item. So, yes. so move. Second. I have a motion made by Trustee Baldini. What they second by Trustee Goff. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries unanimous. Good job, you guys. Thank you. Moving on to sorry, uh, accreditation midterm. Yes. This is going to be environments of accreditation. Senior dean. Senior dean Robin Warren. Uh, get you back up. Did we oh, there yes, carried is away, Doctor Warnhall. Seventeen point two. Uh, Okay. Thank you. So good evening, board members. Uh, I am here to share information regarding the Accrediting Commission for Junior Community and Junior Colleges, that's the ACCJC's requirements for midterm reports submitted by member institutions. Uh, to accompany this agenda item, I posted portions of a document from the ACCJC on the board docs uh, site, and that specifically is the guidelines for preparing institutional reports to the commission. The material posted on the site focuses exclusively on the requirements for the midterm report, so it's uh, excerpts from that larger document. Uh, for those who attended the June 2018 board meeting, this presentation might sound somewhat familiar. Uh, as our midterm report is due later this year, I am here to inform new board members and remind continuing board members about the requirements. So tonight I will outline the report requirements and provide an update on the preparation of our report. A midterm report is required of all member institutions midway between regularly scheduled comprehensive evaluation visits with the new seven-year accreditation cycle, the midterm report is due in year three or four. MVC's report is due in fall 2019, which represents the four-year mark. I've been in contact with the ACCJC staff since we began preparations for our midterm report, and they have indicated that they expect midterm reports to be approximately 20 to 30 pages. So this is intended to be a very focused exercise and one that is evidence heavy and narrative light. The most substantive portions of the midterm report focus on our plans emerging from the most recent comprehensive evaluation, and there are three sources of those plans. Two of them are internal sources, including the plans conveyed in the self-evaluation report itself and the quality focus essay projects in that document. The one external source comes in the form of the external evaluation team's recommendations for improvement. The other substantive portion includes analysis of recent trends in institutional effectiveness measures. So those include student success, completion, transfer, licensure exam pass rates, job placement, and outcomes assessment data, as well as physical performance. 
Uh, in addressing the team's recommendations for improvement, the institution should explain the manner in which each recommendation to improve was considered and what, if anything, was done by the institution as a result of the recommendation. And that the quote on this slide is taken directly from the ACCJC's guidelines, and I'll be discussing it in more detail later in this report. So a key takeaway for tonight is that we are on the case. Uh, we've outlined an approach for drafting the midterm report that reflects recent MVC practices. That approach involves appropriate stakeholders and has been communicated throughout leadership and planning structures. The approach and timeline have been developed to ensure completion and timely submission of our midterm report, which is anticipated in mid-October of this year. So there are eight required components of a midterm report, and they're listed here for you. The first four items outline the structural requirements, so a cover page, certification page, table of contents, and a section describing the report preparation process. Uh, the more substantive or content-heavy sections of the report are highlighted by the bracket, and my presentation will focus on those five content-heavy uh, portions. So the planning and improvement-related portions of the midterm report are outlined on this slide. Throughout MVC's uh, 2015 self-evaluation report, writing teams identified areas for improvement associated with individual accreditation standards. And those items were recorded as action plans and span a number of standards, including those that MVC is meeting or exceeding. Um, so MVC's self-evaluation report actually identified approximately 90 action plans spanning 42 standards. And as these figures uh, might suggest, the improvement items in our self-evaluation report really resemble, resemble more of a list of tasks to be explored or performed rather than fully developed action plans, per se. So uh, for the self-identified improvement items, member institutions are asked to provide a status report, which can be in the form of a table. Um, however, if we took that approach, the table alone would take up about half of the report. So again, 20 to 30 pages. So uh, based on, the, I've talked to the ACCJC staff about this, and um, they have, have suggested that we um, restructure the action plans around general topics or themes, rather than all of those discrete tasks to be addressed one at a time. Um, so that the table listing all of the action items, identifying the associated standards, and outlining how the general themes or topics are addressed in the midterm report, that's all been incorporated into evidence to accompany the report, and that document in and of itself is seven pages long, so that is why it has been removed. Uh, for the section on the uh, response to the team's recommendations for improvement, the wording from the ACCJC's guidelines is reiterated uh, and presented here, and I mentioned it earlier in the presentation. Um, this conveys the expectation that member institutions are to consider the team's recommendations and summarize what, if anything, was done as a result. And the team's recommendations for improvement are based on a snapshot of the institution, which was taken from the perspective of the team at the time of their visit. The recommendations for improvement are really intended to position us for success in future comprehensive reviews. And the idea is that if we're not mindful of these issues or if we get complacent, then we might be at risk of not meeting these standards in 2022. And it is a local decision that is up to us to determine the appropriate course of action on each of the recommendations for improvement. So in, two, in January of 2018, I met with Cabinet to consider, to do just that, to consider each recommendation and identify an administrative lead to help coordinate improvement efforts associated with each recommendation. Assigning an administrative lead to coordinate improvement efforts and collect evidence is similar to the approach we used for our follow-up report in 2017. For each of the remaining eight recommendations, Cabinet determined that we would implement improvements intended to address the team's recommendations, we would highlight progress to date in the midterm report, and we would provide uh, documented evidence of that progress to accompany the report. So the table in this slide describes the eight recommendations for improvement and identifies the administrative lead and any committee or campus group with responsibilities associated with each of the remaining eight recommendations. 
Uh, drafts of this section of the midterm report have been shared with the leads and cabinet, and I'm in the process of collecting all of the associated evidence in support of this part of the report. For the data trend analysis section, member institutions are asked to report data from the last three years. Those data have actually already been submitted to the ACCJC via required annual reports. For the midterm report, member institutions are asked to compare recent performance against established local standards and analyze the data about institutional performance. A reporting form is provided by the ACCJC for this section of the report. Uh, we submitted our 2019 annual report and annual physical report to the ACCJC just last week, as required, and I'm now working on the data and performance summary uh, for this section of our midterm report. Uh, one of the new requirements for accreditation, at least back in 2015, when, we, when MVC piloted what were then the new 2014 standards, um, there was a quality focus essay that was required, um, and in that essay we were to describe two to three action projects, and as indicated here, the three projects that we identified pertain to the areas of student learning assessment, integrated planning and resource allocation, and institutional effectiveness evaluation and review. And uh, for completed projects, member institutions are asked to describe the goals and outcomes of the projects in the midterm report, including improvements in performance and plans to expand effective practices. For those that are in progress, member institutions are asked to provide an update. So I'm in the process of restructuring our quality focus essay to incorporate deliverables and key performance indicators. Uh, the section of the midterm report will include a summary of the improvement efforts following our work with the partnership resource team, which visited us in 2016 per our request and our invitation. Um, and that was made possible through the Institutional Effectiveness Partnership Initiative of the Chancellor's Office. Uh, finally, the appendices in the uh, midterm report will contain the documented evidence in support of the report. So that rounds out the required components. Uh, and finally, I provided a very general timeline for completing the midterm report. Uh, last year, um, so in the spring 2018, we communicated expectations regarding the midterm report. Uh, including the ACCJC requirements, the approach, and the timeline to key stakeholding groups, including the Council of Presidents, President Staff, the Planning and Budget Committee, and the Board of Trustees. I've held regular meetings with the individual administrative leads to collect status reports on activities associated with the team recommendations, and I've done that regularly since last spring. This semester, I've been attending cabinet meetings to share drafts of sections of the report collect their feedback, and identify additional information to incorporate into the draft. Um, the midterm re report will reflect work completed as of the end of May, that's the snapshot date, and then uh, space providing, it will also include any additional plans for improvement between now and 2022, which is the date of our next comprehensive review. Um, the draft of the report will be completed over the summer so that it can be shared with the campus community, including the Board of Trustees, early in the fall semester, and I would target August or September as that, and we anticipate a due date in mid-October. So I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. As always, a very thorough and detailed and outstanding re midterm report. Does anyone have questions from the Board? Great job. Thank Good. you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we're moving to 17.3. This is an action item. This was uh, discussed in our ledge committee. I was not there. I'm going to hand it over to Trustee Baker to unpack these, but we have several bills, uh, assembly and then a Senate bill. So take us so away. So I will very quickly just kind of review these three items. Two of them actually are kind of um, together, I would say, the, the AB 
612 and um, SB 173 are both about uh, CalFresh. And we at the committee meeting had a really great presentation from uh, Benjamin Casada about the um, student food pantry and um, just the great things that they've been doing and that are moving forward. So both of these bills, sorry, <laughs> both of these bills will um, basically just make that program better. It'll, it'll make it easier for students to get access to supplemental food options and we'll cut a lot of red tape. Um, so those two items we reviewed, officially reviewed as the um, committee. The third item, which is AB 1727, was not on our agenda in time for us to take action as a committee, So, but we did review it. So basically what we're doing right now is for the first two, AB 612 and SB 173, those two are coming to the board with the recommendation from the committee that we support those that we or that we direct um, staff um, being Dr. Kraft to write a letter on our behalf in support of those two items. The third one, AB 1727, we, we would have to decide as a board to do that because we did not officially look at that as a committee. Does that make sense? I did. <laughs> we had attachments with these. Yeah. Look at it. <laughs> <laughs> the 17, 1727, um, and as I understood it, it, had, it was to do with uh, how things are reported, and it doesn't really have a huge effect on um, our district, at least not financially, but it, w it does make life easier for us, as I understood it. Um, it makes it uh, less reporting detail, but it would also be of help to other colleges that are still dependent on state apportionment. Is that correct? It is, and, okay. and both Eric and Jessica have left, and I was yeah. hoping they would be here because <laughs> they could really unpack this for us. But yeah, it, it, I mean, we did look at it, and we and um, I, I is it fair to say that we if we we had had it on the agenda that we would have recommended support, but since it wasn't on the agenda, we weren't able to do that. So, <laughs> so, I, I think everybody understands what the goal of the committee is: is to bring for uh, legislation that the board could then support the resolution or a letter. So these are the first three coming to us. So Actually, these are the third, fourth, and fifth because we did two last month. So yeah, um, but uh, yeah, so basically we're, we're not requesting a, a resolution or anything, but in terms of action, what we would be requesting is is this thing going in and out, or is it just me, my it, ears? It, it might be. Okay. <laughs> so um, what we'd be asking is that the chair Direct. of the board direct staff to write a letter on behalf of the board, in this case, three letters, in support of these three items. Is that correct? I don't think you have to be that specific. Okay. I think you could say <laughs> direct staff to act in support of the proposed legislation, and you'd be okay. So moved. <laughs> so, and Holly is going to be help. Yeah, and Holly has doing. been a big help with this, yes. And so, so, that said, do we have a motion? So moved. <laughs> do I have a second? So, I have a motion so by Trustee Baker and a second by second. Trustee Husefa. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries unanimous. Good job, Wedge Committee. Moving on to item 18. This is board policy review and adoption 18.1. These are first readings. They're information. There's no action. This is uh, BP 4100, 5410, 5420, 5570. I'm sure that everyone's read them. Do we have any questions or concerns or? Presentation on them. <coughs> Everyone good? Did you get your questions? I did. Yes, thank you. Okay. A question on uh, four, 5410 pertaining to 
Elections. Okay. Associated student elections. I was just curious. I know. I think this this time around, are we doing kind of in a? Is there actually going to be any sort of vote or? I can't quite. See, yeah. Is there going to be a vote uh, or is this going to be appointment process? I just recall maybe in in, in our, our council's letter when we were going through and talking about revising the bylaws, that yes. a potential option to consider for the bylaws in years where let's say there's not a lot of turnout. Uh, these kind of you know situations mm -hmm. that you wouldn't necessarily have an election, you know, but maybe the um, president would be appointing appointing members. So I just I saw this and I, rem I recalled that mention from council, and I was just just pointed out, just didn't want to limit your options. No, it uh, it doesn't to, in fact. And the yeah. constitution of the ASNBC allows the president and superintendent to fulfill appoint to to create quorum. Yeah. So um, this doesn't change anything in there. Um, this, I, just, I just saw it and I thought yeah. I would mention it. No, it's it. good. I'm glad yeah. you did. And, and our um, our packets for candidates um, just finished. I think we had 16 candidates. How many, Oscar? More like, uh, 18. 18? Yeah, 18 candidates, you know, so. Um, and I think those open up pretty soon. We'll, we'll see how we do. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, so 18.2, this is action. This is second readings for board policies, BP 2510, 5200, 5210, and 5510. Did you? So move. Second. I have a motion by Trustee Baldini and a second by Trustee Rios. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries unanimous, those second readings. 19, board reports. This is, we're gonna start with our standing committee and other appointment reports. So let's start with DAS. We did not meet, we reported in March. Mm -hmm. So VWT, I believe you guys did meet. Well, we met last month, so and we're on a quarterly schedule, so. Okay. Uh, Ledge, Trustee Baker, anything to add? Uh, the only thing I would add is that one of the things we discussed and just want to make certain that the board's comfortable with it too is um, we had uh, in last month we had as a board um, directed Dr. Kraft to write two letters in support of a couple of different items, which he did. And, um, and he wrote them on behalf of the college and our recommendation was for future letters that he um, include something that said that the board ha it was in support of it as well. So At the recommendation of the board right. or upon approval right. of the board, yeah. Thank so you. Just want to put that out there. Duly noted. Good point. Thank you. Uh, all right. Audit and Finance Committee. Okay. Real Property Management Committee. Trustee Rios. Uh, nothing to report. The two groups that we've been waiting on are still not ready to present to the committee. All right. And... Trustee Goff, you've got some I, I action coming your way. They're, they're, taking, um, they're taking nominations, but I haven't been invited to do anything. So I'm still sitting here <laughs> waiting for something to happen. I hope I'm not supposed to be doing anything. But I figure an email will come inviting me to do something. So I'm very excited. I know it's coming. We're on it. I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting. You're good. So you'll be the first to know if I do something. Awesome. Thank you. All right, so future agenda item request. This is item 19.2, board reports. I'm gonna, let's start with the student okay, trustee. I'll start, oh, thank you. Uh, nothing much, just uh, continual NBC Leadership Academy, wonderful. Um, uh, we have our, every week, ASNBC, we have work groups, so we, we're still working on things and we send our work group notes, have, you know, uh, our minutes to Ben and Dr. Kraft. So if we have something for approval, that can be applied through that. So we have a process set up. Uh, and uh, uh, then, uh, so one, one good thing was that when we were talking about AB 30 and 291, so I thought it was good to have student support. So I sent two letters to CCLC and to the respective legislators letting them know that um, as a student trustee, and I've had a conversation with the ASNBC board as well. Uh, minor, I didn't have it in full discussion, but I did receive information from them that they were in support. Uh, so I've uh, sent those letters. 
Uh, and I'm I, and I'm in uh, conversation with Holly that I might be able to go to Sacramento, so be able to give support for those mm -hmm. Senate and Assembly bills. And one last thing is the Puente celebration, like very. I think it's uh, one of those things where if you go, you don't uh, forget to cherish those moments. I think that ends my report. Trustee was safe, a great job. Any future agenda item request? Because that was the heading we are in, but you're good. Did I get ahead of myself? No, you're good. <laughs> May have just, been my. I gave my report away. <laughs> we did have a question though about the about the minutes thing. For yeah, I can. Yeah, that future. Uh, the, it was um, came through your report in the in the ASNBC earlier. Um, it w it is inappropriate for this board to approve those minutes. However, so I'm I'm going to work as you know from staff and superintendent president position to review. I'll, I'm going to meet with Ben and um, Raphael, and see how we might back into those significant days when they approved mostly what i want to do is ensure that the money flows we can look at those dates um the approval for dollars and go back and and um ensure that they were i still am out for legal on the final list on this it's a kind of an unprecedented piece but but this board cannot approve the minutes of something you weren't at it gets very yeah. very difficult it would not be my advice to you to do that yeah so I will work on it as a staff, and it's not coming back here as a future um, agenda item, but I'm happy to report on it. Uh, Any other I d ones? I did, actually. Uh, based on uh, Christie's report earlier, um, I would be interested in knowing more about the whole part-time uh, office hours thing and what we might be able to do to support that. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Yep. That was, that was one of mine, definitely. The other is, you know, we had somebody come and, and talk about the P-ticket thing. I, I would like to know more about that. I mean, I think she had a good argument as far as she took the time to bring it to our attention. I think we, we owe her to look into that. So I'd, I'd like that as a future agenda item as well. Anybody else? Just a comment on that item. Um, I mean, I don't know how many students are having this, this issue how big it is, well, the one thing that kind of concerned me was more a due process kind of issue where she says that they try to get in contact and appeal these things and there's no response and mm -hmm. um, those things just kind of then fall off, you know, the, the radar. Um, and that, that's an issue that I'm a little more concerned about, that students have recourse for whatever, you know, issues they're, they're coming up against. So I'll could support we, my colleagues and, uh, and could we bring back a, I guess not an overhaul, but a review of the process? Mm -hmm. I think I would ask, yes. I, I don't think this, it warrants probably a, you know, an agenda item. It, it warrants a deep dive, but Oscar will work with in the process, and then I'll provide updates to the board on the, how the process is working, <clears throat> and then if, if that's something that you want to policy-wise change, then We'll work. We'll go from there. And can we get back okay. to the uh, the woman who came uh, to just let her know that we are looking into her comments, just so she knows that we're listening. I mean, I sure. think that would. Be, yeah. I can't recall her name, but Christina. Would, Christina, yeah, her last Christina name. Christina Goodman. Goodman, yeah. yeah. Good. That's good. All right. Let's go to trustee and board chair reports. Trustee Josefa, you've anything to add? I think I already gave my report in 19.2, <laughs> so. Let's, Sorry about that. Let's go down the line. Trustee Baldini. Yes, good evening. I'm pretty fairly active. I was able to also attend the Puente 15th anniversary celebration. It was particularly heartening to see it uh, as I was in the, um, on the board when it was instituted and, and approved by the Board of Trustees. I was also uh, able to uh, attend at the Upper Valley campus, uh, Chef Greg Moralia, I emphasize chef, uh, in his Italian um, uh, cooking uh, class. And I was able to uh, wear another hat as well as uh, represent the board as well as provide authentic Italian hand-painted uh, ceramics for, for the food to be plated on. And... Um, this uh, this past 
weekend, I was a guest to the president of the, the Rosie the Riveter Trust and sat at the, the head table with uh, Jonathan Jarvis, who was appointed uh, director of the National Park Service by President Obama in 2007 and retired in, in uh, 2017 and is now with the University of California at Berkeley, uh, the uh, uh, director of the Institute for Parks, People, and Biodiversity. And that's, uh, they, they, they look at critical issues facing uh, uh, not only the parks, but locals, uh, state and local, as well as um, areas, uh, equivalent uh, protected areas. So I, I did talk to him about our speaker series here at Napa Valley College, uh, also the, posing the question of, of monoculture, the, the agriculture preserve, and uh, you know, that viticulture. Um, how it dominates our valley, and um, I told him I would put him in contact with folks that that uh, he would be interested in, and if we had such a an event, to uh, to speak to to interested parties, or even if it's just students or uh, anyone else, and uh, that is uh, so the. There is a, uh, a national park, uh, Rosie the Riveter and Wendy the Welder, which is more appropriate, but a lot of things happen down in the Richmond area. And I was able to speak with Mayor Butts, and, and they've also been hiring our uh, police academy graduates over the years, and he's been uh, down there for some time. So interesting evening. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Trustee Baker. Uh, let's see. I went to the mariachi festival here at, in the gymnasium, and it was just, it was amazing, honestly. It was, it was, it was very, very cool, and I, was, I, I brought my son, Nicholas, and, we were, and there were two young ladies who refused to make eye contact with him, I noticed, um, that were from his school that had gone through the, um, I guess, through the workshop, and they were sitting late like right standing right in front of us while they were playing but they wouldn't look at him <laughs> so, but it, my favorite part though of the whole evening was uh, uh, we were in the front row and during several of the songs I kept hearing people behind me singing and I turn around and everyone was singing along and it was just it was so I don't know I almost started crying because it was just such a fantastic community event and to be able to feel that was just fantastic so I, I hope that becomes an annual thing um, went to the Puente Quinceanera and um, did not bring my um, my 12 year old with me that time although he would have enjoyed it because I got to have Doritos and cupcakes for dinner um, <laughs> and I brought him I did take him to see the Treasure Island um, program which was also so fantastic and he halfway through it went oh wait I think I did read this book <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was, and I got seasick a couple times with the with the um, the fun stuff they were doing with the set so that was fun so uh, uh, we're gearing up for end of the year lots of stuff to do on campus and uh, happy National Library Week today is take action for libraries day so think about and tell your library story Thank you, Jennifer. Trustee Dodd. Uh, let's see. Um, well, I got to meet with the Academic uh, Senate with Faye and Amanda, which was really nice uh, with uh, uh, Trustee Goff. I also had a really uh, a very good meeting uh, sitting down with uh, Nancy and Magdalene at the Student Health Center, just learning about everything that they do, which I think Student Health Center is going to be, if we're talking about student housing, one of those things that we need to be uh, thinking about, how that impacts the uh, rest of rest of the campus. I think that was a really enlightened me on that. Um, certainly what they've seen in there is uh, really uh, Magdalene is, um, who does a lot of the, um, the psychological and, and that sort of uh, counseling uh, work with students. She's seen a lot of just increased stress with, with students and, and, and those uh, she's seen a lot more of those cases right now and high anxiety, um, which I guess is just the commonplace now. Um, and everything's going well with the baby. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Trustee Rios. Um, I just wanted to congratulate Oscar on the Mariachi Festival. I had uh, 
very uh, same impression as uh, Jennifer. I just got a, a really strong sense of community at that um, at the festival. I thought it was great. And I hope it does come back. So thank you, Oscar. Yeah. Thank you, Raphael, Trustee Goff. So, you know, I, I, I'm repeating myself. The Mariachi Festival was great. Uh, it was an inspiration, so Oscar and I are hatching a plan, so we'll see if that, that happens. Um, I want to thank Amanda and Faye and Eric. I've met with them um, and learned a lot. This is just such an exciting time at the college. Uh, I believe uh, Trustee Dodd and I have meetings on Thursday. This Thursday, are you going to be there, or is it just me? <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, next Thursday, next Thursday, to, to meet with um, other departments and, and really get a feel for the college. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, I went to the Puente celebration, but I didn't get to stay long. But um, it's so impressive, just the support that um, the community college is providing is, is really, really impressive. Um, in my day job, uh, we have put together a program called Community Learning Walks, and I want to extend an invitation to all of you because you are a part of them, whether you know that or not. Um, having uh, Napa Valley College classrooms on our campus is one more thing that our high school can brag about. So we have started inv inviting the community in and spending lunch with our, our culinary club lunch, which was awesome. It was a three-course meal. Who knew? And then I have the privilege of actually giving uh, the participants a tour of our campus and introducing them to different classes and showing them what works. The tiny house is one thing everybody wants to see, so we go down and see that. Um, you actually, We're actually putting this on in conjunction with our Chamber of Commerce, and that's how you sign up. So with your permission, I'd like to forward you the link that you can maybe send out to not only the Board of Trustees, but maybe the faculty. And if anybody is interested in participating in those walks, uh, we'd certainly love to have you. Uh, we're always excited to have you on campus and make those connections that are so utterly valuable to all of our students. So I wanted to put that out there. So I'll get that to you probably tomorrow for you to forward. Great, thank you. Thank you, Trustee oh, Segura. Uh, <laughs> we. Janine, Dr. Kraft, and I had a lot of fun at the Mariachi Festival. We even danced, yeah, we danced. and sang yeah, along with the music. So, yes, congratulations. Amazing musicians, am amazing students, and it, that, I mean, that was the more, most gratifying that, you know, they dedicate so much time to learning the music, and then they're going to universities. Mm -hmm. So, so that very awesome, very enlightening, very wonderful event. I usually don't miss quinceañeras. I am so sorry I missed the Puente one. Um, sounds like I, I missed a, a wonderful event. I was really sorry to have missed it. And so, I know. Um, and that was it. Thank you. Um, I missed the Mariachi Festival. I apologize. I was at a prior commitment to Mentis. Uh, we had our annual gala, Blue Skies Ahead. Uh, great organization, but great stuff happening here. Good questions, good robust discussions tonight, and thank you, Christy and Amanda, for sticking it out. And yeah. <laughs> good, good stuff all around. So thank you. And with that, I'm going to announce our future meeting for May 9th, 2019. It'll be a regular meeting. And that said, we're closing this meeting at 8:38.